like a unbounded uh, exponential. So hopefully I'm ahead of the game here. Okay, folks. So um, <clears throat> today's the last lecture. Um, hope you all are happy. I know we still got one week of getting getting work done, but uh, but you don't have to stare at me anymore, unless you watch the videos, of course, which have all been recorded. <laughs> The videos to look back. Great. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna get them all posted to YouTube too afterwards, and uh, we'll uh, I, uh, see if anybody else watches them too. Some I've got a few YouTube. Uh, vi Actually, my tutorials on this dynamic stuff that I've given at SciPy have about 12,000 views, so that, those are doing pretty decent. So maybe this will some people will care about it too. Um, well, we lucked up on that because we have had some students from Lawrence Livermore that take it as uh, um, distant learning. Okay, so yeah, today's the last day. What I want to do is um, go through, uh, talk about the linearization some more so that you can get an idea of that. If you um, are interested in controls, um, it's an extremely valuable uh, thing to be able to linearize these systems. And, um, and, and there's also other uh, valuable aspects that aren't, aren't just tied to controls. For example, um, the optimizations that we did, if you do any gradient-based optimizations, you have to um, essentially linearize the system about any given operating point to um, determine um, uh, the gradients and, the, um, and such for your optimization algorithm. So it all, t it all wraps into that, too. We'll do that, and then um, I'll spend a little time on talking about rigid body attitude and... Um, more than s simple rotations and try to give you a little bit of intro to that. I doubt we will be able to get into it super in depth. And then um, also I want to take some time at the end of the class to do the course evaluations. Okay, if you haven't filled those all out, we'll, we'll take a little bit of time. And um, any, any questions about clarifications in the exam or, or anything? Uh, and one other note too, um, I'm going to um, I'll post, I'm going to post some office hours for both my classes um, before all the final assignments are due tomorrow, I mean, for next week. So you'll, you guys are due Thursday, right? Tuesday and Thursday. So I'll post, um, I'll have something on Monday, um, and I'll send that out to you all, okay? Uh, no, because I haven't done that. How about one of you take care of that for me and go ask Jacob Katata to borrow, whoever needs that. Go ask Jacob Katata to borrow one, okay? Because I'm, I got too many things, and I'll guarantee I'll forget it. All right, got it. You go do it, Chris. Yeah. Is that what I'm saying? Okay. Any any other questions? Clarification on the exam. Um, uh, there was a question. Maybe I haven't answered it yet. There are um, uh, two independently rolling wheels in the problem, right? Those will be two rigid bodies. And then there will be a, um, a rigid body for the trailer frame. Three rigid bodies. Okay, that's, that's it. And I think, didn't you ask that question to me via email? Does that answer your question? Does that answer? Three rigid bodies. Yeah, two wheels and a trailer frame. And they all have um, uh, mass, inertia, and geometry associated with, with those. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so there will be three rigid bodies. And, um, and I think another question, Jess, you may have asked, did the um, spring only travel um, in one direction? And it does. It, um, the, the points P, Q, and AO are all on a line. So the, sp the spring can only stretch along that line. So one of the springs doesn't pivot? There's no pivoting of the spring. It's not a torsional spring. It's uh, The, uh, AO, uh, Q, right, and P, all three of those are on a line, okay? So, you, so there is no flexibility there. <clears throat> and then I think the other clarification, too, that this velocity, though, can be pointed in any direction. And that's going to be made up of two components. A VX, 
of t in the nx plus a vy of t in the ny. So there's no, there's no z component. Okay, so you basically this trailer, you know, is being just pulled around. It can't, it can't bob up and down. Like, um, that, that would be more realistic, I guess. But uh, we're just pulling the trailer around um, on a surface. And so the, that's the only component. So I think those are a couple of other clarifications there. Yeah, or the whole steel structure of the, fr of the frame. You know, you could imagine that um, from the wheels, essentially, to the hitch, there's some flexibility that, that could happen. And uh, that lumps it all into this sort of lumped parameter. Yeah. You could think of it as just the hitch ball bending or something, or the hitch. Say that again. Yep. So you... <clears throat> You will have some coordinate that tells you that distance, and um, and it only is along that line. The PQ and AO all lie on one line. All right. So, did anybody take? Uh, did you take 134, Chris? Vehicle stability with Dr. Carnot? No. No. It wasn't uh, Got it. Well, he. He teaches a vehicle stability class, and this problem is a, a more, um, he, he does a simpler 2D model of, of this kind of trailer in that class, and this is a 3D model of it, basically. So it's a similar thing. But, um, okay, other questions? All righty. Uh, no questions on the presentation? Yes, so today, um, after today, I'm done with both of my classes teaching uh, the lectures, so I'm gonna, I'll get all the stuff tidied up as fast as I can and try to put up whatever those missing pieces are. So one of the missing notebooks has the visualization we did in class, and um, another missing notebook, uh, the optimization one, too, I'll, 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 I'll post. Are you talking about the matplotlib animations, the 2D ones? Yeah, you can, um, you can export it to a, a video, like a MP4 or something. If there, there's a, I think there's a thing that's like two, uh, I, forget the, I forget the commands, but yeah, you can save that as a video. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that only, so that little save button only saves what whatever frame you see at that moment at that moment if you want to save the video as a as a mp4 or something like that you have to you know there's that there's that funk animation thing um, if you if you call that and name whatever it outputs some variable then you can do dot um, save maybe uh, to video there's there's some there's some uh, you look in the documentation of animations for matplotlib, there's a save video function. You could get an MP4 of that. Uh, you can also, um, well, I think that's, that's sufficient. So you can save that video. Um, the PyDie 3D ones, though, do not have a save button uh, in, any, in any form. The only way to do that at the moment is to use a screen capture. And um, that's, a, that's a to do. And speaking of that, um, I'll say this now too. Uh, if you like this stuff, um, you know, we have sort of a development team that um, works on developing this software as part of SimPy in particular, all the symbolic stuff, and then PyDi too. SimPy, um, I think we just topped over some something like 600 con contributors over the last 10 years. Um, so there's 600 different people that have helped put this software together that you've used. And um, it has now over 30,000 commits, which means every time somebody writes a new chunk of code and submits it to the code repository. So it's, it's huge. And um, <clears throat> the, you can sort of see the, let me, uh,
this is the uh, where the GitHub page where we manage it. If I click this, um, shows the activity. So it's about it's about ten years old. I think it's technically started in two thousand six, but we didn't have it uh, in the repository. And we've had six hundred contr contributors over those um, just over ten years. Um, you know, adding um, adding to this piece of software, and the software does a lot. Um, it's essentially, um, you know, it's supposed to be an open source, um, viable competitor to any of the proprietary uh, symbolic packages that you can find, like Mathematica and MathCat, etc. So the key thing is, if you like this stuff and you like, and you might have an interest in committed, there's a good way to get started. It's called the Google Summer of Code program, and I have been a mentor since about 2009 um, to, to about 10 students over the past, um, you know, eight, eight years or so. Um, Google, uh, Simpy has participated in, in every single year since 2007, maybe, or, or pretty on, pretty on, and we um, we get about uh, 60 to 70 thousand dollars from Google, and then um, we hire summer interns essentially to develop new aspects and um, and the each intern gets about 6500 bucks for the summer as a thing so if if that's um, attractive in March is when they're due but you basically around January 1st you should probably get started you have to write a proposal and submit um, a patch to, to Simpy or more to sort of show um, your what you want to do and things but I've had um, the linearization thing that we use today. Like I had a student um, in 2000, I don't know, 10 or 11, I think. When was that? I don't. I can't remember what year. But anyways, had a, a graduate student out of um, Florida, University of Florida, wrote uh, wrote the linearization um, aspects, and um, we'll see that in a little bit. And um, he immediately got a job um, in Austin at um, Anaconda, who makes the pack, the big, the big distribution you install, and you know he makes probably a hundred, almost a hundred grand a year um, writing code for them, and uh, so it's it's a neat pathway. Um, I have other students that are now working at Google um, that came out of this program. We have a number of uh, people that got hired at Google. We have uh, several people that also got hired. This student, this guy's also hired by Anaconda Inc., and he works for them. You know, and they're making pretty good bucks. Um, writing this stuff. They aren't doing, um, some of them are working on some Simpy related things, uh, but it turns out that all of the magic that makes Simpy happen, happen, um, a, a, a core data structure is um, related to the um, trees and graphs that represent all of the symbolic operations. And it turns out that that is, um, if you've heard of things like um, Google's TensorFlow or Facebook's Torch, these are the um, hottest machine learning, uh, deep learning um, tools these days. And they operate on creating a graph of operations that can ultimately be pushed out to GPU farms. And it's the same technology that helps Simpy do what it does. And uh, for example, Matt Rockland, this guy here, he um, developed Simpy, wrote a thesis on a lot of uh, core data structure algorithms in SimPy uh, for his PhD. And then he got hired also by um, Anaconda. And he um, has now developed this program called DASK, which is <clears throat> a distributed uh, machine learning tool that um, takes all the computations that you need to do in your machine learning and um, parallelizes them across clusters. Uh, and it uses the same kind of graph technology that he developed when he worked on the Simpy project. So, if you have if you have interest, if you like software and things, um, you know, come talk to me, uh, and and you get and there's a potential paid summer opportunity to bring it, you know, increase your chops or whatever on um, on software. And I've I found I got into this as a grad student. Um, basically, I took this class, and we were taught an old proprietary piece of software that. Um, when I tried to solve my problems when I, uh, for my dissertation work, hit hit all the walls of that software, 
And um, we met the lead developer, or the guy that invented this. Two of my lab mates um, met him. He's uh, on this list here. Uh, this guy. He now works at, um, um, uh, what's the big lab in New Mexico? I'm blanking. I just sent out the thing to you. Los Alamos. Uh, but he invented it, and um, we hooked up with him, and he helped us write all this stuff or get started and write the software. And then it sort of um, took away the bounds and, and let us solve the problems that we needed to solve for our graduate work. And since then, I've been highly in, um, involved in the development communities for a number of open source packages in the, in the SciPy world. And um, I go to SciPy conference every year and present, and, um, and I've had a number of collaborations that have, you know, played out because of that. And a lot of my students now are, are getting hired by uh, top companies uh, for the skills that they have developed as part of, part of this. And um, I, uh, I really like this community, too. The other thing is it's very different than a typical academic community. I find most of the mechanical engineering conferences I go to super dry and boring. And um, there's some cool talks occasionally, but um, there's not really a strong community of people that work together in, a, um, in the way that we do here. So this fosters a very interesting um, set of academics and, um, and industrial folks that uh, work together um, and really together on projects. And it's, um, I've written a number of grants with a collection of them, uh, grant proposals, and, um, and, and done all kinds of work in different domains because of that. So, there's a, there's a uh, open source in SimPy pitch. If that um, sounds interesting to anybody, you know, come talk to me. All right. So let's talk about linearization. Any questions on that? So when we left last time, um, we talked about we were I was introducing or reminding you of what a Taylor series expansion is. And a Taylor series expansion um, of a single variate function of some variable x about some point a ends up, um, let me just write the, uh, this form more succinctly, looks like that. So I can take a bunch of nth derivatives, evaluate those derivatives at the point A of interest, divide by n factorial here, and then multiply by um, these power terms, x minus a to the power n. And if I make an infinite number of that sum, I can construct any function that you can, any mathematical function there that I can take a derivative, a continuous derivative of. So this, um, we don't need the whole thing, though. Uh, it turns out that the first two terms then end up being um, f prime of evaluated a over one factorial and uh, times x minus a to the one. So these are the first two terms, and these are linear. These are um, do not have pa powers higher than one of x. So this is a, the linear version of f of x about point a. Okay, and in our case, I alluded to that a is going to be tied to the equilibrium point that we want to linearize our system about. So that's a single variate function. There's a corollary. Um, you can I'll write out the first terms of the uh, multivariate function. Right, we have. Our equations of motion are not functions of a single variable. They're functions of a lot of variables in general. Um, if I 
think of a function fx, fy, fz, then um, the first linear terms of that will look like this. Let me write this more clearly. Okay. So the, this is what the first terms of a of, of function of three variables looks like. I evaluate the um, uh, function at this point, A, B, C, where, where it is x equals A, y equals B, and z equals C. And then I get these um, very similar looking terms as above that have a linear or linear in x, y, and z. Uh, but I'm taking the partial derivative of f with respect to that particular a variable there. So the partial of f with respect to x, y, and z, and then I evaluate that partial derivative at the point that I want to linearize about. And that's uh, this a, b, c. Okay? So, for, we just have to be able to take partial derivatives of our function f to construct this and substitute in these points. Uh, these uh, configuration values in our case that correspond to an equilibrium point that we want to linearize about. So that's the multivariate um, function. Now, we've uh, we've talked. Did we, have we talked about uh, Jacobi in, in here? We did because we I think we've used it. So just to, as a reminder, um, what is a Jacobian? Do you remember when we said before? It's a matrix of partial derivatives. So the Jacobian of f, um, if we have this x, y, z, so the, I'll write this, Jacobian of f equals a matrix of partial derivatives. And um, we're going to take um, the partial with respect to x, y, and z. And in this case, um, partial of f with respect to x partial of f with respect to y, partial of f with respect to z. Okay, so if f is a single function, right, this is uh, not a, a vector function, we get a column. If f, in our case, we have um, lots of equations of motion, right, for every single degree of freedom of the system, we will have some f. So if f is a um, vector function, and then we have A, B, and C, or X, Y, and Z, then we would have a, a matrix then. So if we have F bar, right, and um, let's just say that um, this is in uh, two dimensions, right, we just have two equations, F bar, then if I want the Jacobian of F bar, then I'm going to get a 2 by 3. So I'll have the same thing, um, f1 partial of x, f2 partial of y, or sorry, f1 partial of f1 with respect to z, and a partial of f2 x y z. Okay, and then there's a uh, um, three by two, sorry. So we have a row for each variate and a column for each um, equation in, in this vector function f. Okay, so this is, this is the kind of Jacobian that we can imagine getting from our equations. We have um, f in our um, p, the number of degrees of freedom, and 
how many variables do we have? Well, we got a lot of variables. We've got, um, if I write f, so fr plus fr star equals zero, we can write that as f of uh, the q's, the u's, the u dots, and these are vectors, um, and t, right? So these um, is equivalent to that up there, and uh, there's n of these, um, there's p of these, p of these. So we've got that many variables, n plus 2, I mean, n plus 2 times p. And, um, and then if time is explicit too, um, that's one more variable that we would have to um, take care of there. So if, if we now have this in mind, it turns out that we can write um, the Taylor series in vector form. So for example, if I have um, if I have this now a vector equation, again of just three variables, then I can evaluate that at A B C plus I can write all those other terms that I have here, these par partials can write all of them um, in terms of the Jacobian. So the Jacobian of F bar evaluated at A, B, C times, and I'm going to introduce a vector V minus V naught here, where V equals A, B, uh, I'm sorry, X, Y, Z, and V naught equals um, x naught, y naught, z naught, some point that you want to linearize about. So if you um, write these out, you will end up with the same equations that I had before. Uh, we could do that. It wouldn't take too long. Um, I can sort of write it like this now, too. f of v equals f of v naught plus the Jacobian of f with respect to v times v minus v naught. And then if we write those out, um, we're going to have uh, three equations, f1, uh, or f, uh, I don't have a number of equations, f to f n, for example, of that will be that first vector. And each of those will be evaluated at x naught, y naught, z naught. Plus, we've got this Jacobian now, and it's going to be um, 3 by, uh, in our case, we have three variables. Um, sorry, it's going to be n by 3. So we'll have the partial of F1 with respect to x naught, and this will be the partial of Fn with respect to x naught, and uh, partial of F1 with respect to y naught, partial of F1 with respect to z naught. Uh, it's not, there's, those bottom ones are not not sorry. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So we take the partial, and then each one of those expressions have to be, um, I'll write it like this, evaluated at uh, V naught. That's why I screwed up right there. That's supposed to be a V naught. And then all of that is times um, X, Y, Z minus X naught, Y naught, Z naught. Okay. And, that, and this is the case only if um, we don't have, uh, well, that, that's the case right here, right? We only have X, Y, and Z. 
So you see, see this relationship now? I can write this in vector form. Um, and what that means is, is if I, if I have f, I plug in these values to get that. I calculate the Jacobian here um, to get all these partial derivatives. And then I plug in v naught into all those. And then I multiply, matrix multiply this matrix times this column vector. And those, that would be a linear uh, vector equation there of, uh, of all of the variables. So for the dynamics that we have, once again, we have fr plus fr star equals 0, where r equals 1 to p, okay, for a um, general system. No, number of degrees of freedom, if it's holonomic, p equals n, and if, if it's not, p is less than n. So if you recall, um, this is some vector function, as I just wrote before, of the q's, the u's, the u dots, and t. So <clears throat> let's, let's say that for now, just to be um, simple, that, that there is no explicit function of t there. Um, but we just have the u's, the u dots, and the q's. I can then form a vector v that is um, u stacked on top of u, u stacked on top of u dot. Okay, so just stack these, and then this is going to be um, n plus 2p by 1 in sides, right? That's that vector. So these are all the variables that are in there um, that we have interest in um, we're trying to linearize the configuration, speed, and accelerations about some equilibrium point. And then we can also introduce, if we happen to know our equilibrium point, um, q naught, u naught, and uh, u dot naught. Well, an equilibrium point, um, these are always going to be zero, right? Because um, we find our equilibrium points. Um, when the system is stationary. But the configuration might be some configuration, and we, and we guessed at those last time. So this will ultimately be, will look like that always, right? We'll just have some configuration um, values that represent the equilibrium, and then uh, the equilibrium is when there is no motion, so those will be both zero in our case. Um, and then the last thing we need to do is we have to calculate that Jacobian, right? And so the Jacobian of um, our f here is the partials um, with respect to v. So the partial of f with respect to all the uh, values in v are going to populate this Jacobian matrix. And we have... Um, um, this n times 2p are the number of variables, and then we're going to have p um, equations in that. So our Jacobian, then, is going to be of size um, it'll have p rows by n plus 2p columns, right? And we can calculate that. And, 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 and once we have that of our uh, dynamics equations there, we can plug it into that equation that I have there at the top. And we will get a linear form of the dynamic equations. That we will not see any um, q squares, u squares, when you'll see no signs of q's so, or anything like that. that that'll all be gone. Um, from the from this process, so this is a, a systematic way to uh, do that. And if you have an explicit t, um, you'll have one. You have t in this in here, and then you need the um, 
partial of f with respect to t as, a, as an additional. And I guess there's, there's really no reason not to write that. I just didn't write it before, but uh, I'm not, I'll, I'll leave it what I got so I don't screw it up. But it's, not, it's trivial to, if you have uh, t in there, too. But this gives you the idea. Okay. Um, questions on that? Yeah, so we have n minimal number of generalized coordinates, p independent u's, and p independent u dots. All right, so if I have my equations of motion in its sort of minimal set, minimal form, that only are in terms of the independent u's and the um, uh, independent generalized coordinates, then that's where we would get that. This this would be in, in a holonomic system. This is n plus two n, three n, right? So three n. Okay. Now this procedure um, works um, as stated, unless one thing, and that is if you have. Um, <clears throat> It's not always possible. So I, I would have given you an exam earlier, but I, I, um, Thursday I uh, picked a problem for the exam, started doing it, and um, it was a um, slider mechanism. And uh, we talked about way, well, a long time ago now um, the crank slider or a, cr or a um, four bar linkages and some of these things. Those have um, non trivial holonomic constraints for the configuration. All right, so if I have a crank slider, for example, um, this link rotates and then this block slides along the line. So that link would roll it, rotate and the block, block would move back and forth. You have to instigate a, uh, or inis um, instantiate a configuration constraint, right? So that would have um, one coordinate to get that angle, one coordinate to tell you this angle, and then a configuration constraint would say, well, the point always has to be on the line. And that's going to create a nonlinear equation and um, that relates the two coordinates of this system. And, it, and in general, those are um, often very complicated, and you can't solve them analytically. Okay, You can't solve them symbolically or analytically. So sometimes your equations of motion have more than n q's in them to deal with these um, configuration constraints. So that, I picked a problem that had one of those in it, and it ended up being way too nasty. And, and um, I knew you guys would hate you would have hated me if I gave you that uh, for sure. You might already hate me for what I gave you, but uh, that one you would have uh, really hated me. So I dropped that problem and made and did the second problem. But anyways. Um, what, why I'm saying this is that this procedure I just showed you will work except if you have this dependent speed, um, I mean, sorry, dependent coordinate in here that you can't explicitly remove. Um, and you got to make sure that you apply the chain rule properly when you do these derivatives, and there's some more details there. I'll leave it at that. But there's, um, if you ever have a uh, unsolvable, un unanalytically solvable uh, configuration constraint, be careful about the linearization process. That, that's the, the key takeaway there. But most of the time, many problems, you don't have that. So, questions? Now, did I answer you? What did you I forgot what you answered me already. How oh, yeah, the size of that, that thing. Anything else? So let, let's, uh, it turns out that this is uh, really simple in SymPy <laughs> with typing a little code. So let's, let's open up SymPy. And I want to look at, um, for the last half of the first part of the class, um, why, why that, so, something saves.
Uh, I don't have my passphrase. I'm going to switch computers. So what I want to do is um, on, lec uh, on lecture, which one do I want to copy? I think it's, I want to get the equations of the funky pendulum that we did. I think that's 1701. Let's double check. Yeah, three coordinates, whole gnomic system. And we get um, equations of motion here. All right, so it's, Lecture 1701, you can download it or whatever, but I'm going to make a copy of that. And if you recall, right, this, this system is this. Okay, and we had um, Q1. Q1 and U1 are the same. Q2, Q3. And last time we talked about the equilibrium points. We knew we said there was one vertical, um, both of them up, and then these are these other funky ones that we could sort of get it into a configuration. Okay, so I've got this copy here. Let me rename it. Um, is this lecture 20 or 21? Do we have an extra one? 20? I'll just go with 20. And uh, just go ahead and let's execute till we get FR and FR star. And then I'm going to delete the rest of this. Okay, so I have fr and fr star here. Let's make a function um, f that's just fr plus fr star. And these are all the time varying quantities in here. We have the two specified force and torque, three coordinates, the three speeds, and the derivatives of the three speeds in there, okay? So, um, a few things. One is that let's create our vector v, okay? So, <clears throat> let's linearize about when q2 and q3 are zero. We all believe, we believe that, and q1 is zero too. Um, so, let's create an equilibrium vector, and um, I'm going to do v uh, zero equals sm dot matrix, and I'm going to make that be um, zero q one, zero q two, zero q three, all zeros. In fact, the easy way to do this is zeros. Um, we've got nine by one. All right, so that's going to be our equilibrium vector, and then v in our case, is going to be uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, um, U1, U2, U3, U1 diff, U2 diff, and U3 diff. Okay? So these are the um, things that I want to linear, I want to linearize with respect to these coordinates speeds and accelerations at this equilibrium point. Chris? So, you know, 
V naught is the equilibrium point. Um, okay, so if I <clears throat> let this thing um, settle out, it's going to tend to that. That's the static position after some some time. Um, and we want to <coughs> we want to investigate the small motions about that configuration. So the first thing is that the config. Um, these are always going to be zero, the u's and the q's. I'm sorry, the u's and the u dots, because it's we're talking about a static equilibrium. And then the q's, they can be they could be values, specific values that we want to um, look at, because this has multiple um, equilibrium points. We're going to pick one of them. Does that answer your question or clarify it at all? Yeah, I mean, the equilibrium We're choosing it right now. Everything's still. Yeah. Could choose that. In fact, you want to do that? Well, we'll do that too. But so the first thing I want to talk about, though, is um, uh, I'm going to do. I'm going to make something called a V subs. Uh, I, got, I went a little far here. So that's our equilibrium point. Now you can you can find the equilibrium point um, using the equations in motion. If I set the u's and the u dots to zero, that's going to give me equations that only have the q's in them, and I call that um, f static. And let's I'm not sure if I have these yet, but let's just create. Um, these two. You may have done this a little out of order, but All right, so those are just two major things. Let's take F and substitute in first. Um, I'm going to use. I'm going to zip together. The u, di u dots with um, sm dot zeros. Actually, we know they're just three, so I'll do zero, zero, zero. All right, so this sets the accelerations to zero in the in F. All right, so I just substituted zero for all the accelerations, and now why is u two dot in there? Maybe this is supposed to, does this have to be dick around this? Dicked? Okay. Here, that's a, a way to make a dictionary that maps u1 to 0, u2 to 0, u3 to 0. In fact, <clears throat> I don't know why I need to do that. It's not very explicit, but uh, let's just be more explicit there. All right, so that, that's clear what we're doing. Um, or not, not quite. <laughs> I need diff. Set the accelerations to zero. All right. Well, we still have velocities. Um, for, a sta for the static equations, we set those to zero, too. So I'm, I'm going to do those after that in a separate subs um, to make sure that order of operation works here. Here are the equations. These are the static force balance equations. Okay? And some set of Q's will make these equal to zero. Okay, so the F is equal to zero, F R plus F R star is equal to zero. And then if there's no motion, these these must hold. Right? So let's call that these are the dynamic equations that are represent the static force balance. If we look at them, we can see that if I put in zero for all the Q's, um, all I'm going to be left with is F and T. Now, F and T, 
um, should also be zero, right? We're not applying any forces in the static case. F is zero, T and zero. Add that there too. Subs. Right. Now, if I set Q1, Q2, and Q3 all to zero, that goes to zero, that goes to zero, that goes to zero. So that's a valid equilibrium point. Right? If we set, um, so we can check that, right? Is that, is, that, is that equilibrium point valid? It is. Now, we also said that if Q2 is pi, that should also be valid. So let's check that. Also a valid equilibrium point. OK. Um, now, I don't know exactly what angles the other ones would be, but we, we were saying that if we um, uh, rotate this thing around such this spring is stretched out. Um, sorry, the spring is stretched out here, and then we have Q2 flipped around, and then Q2, Q1 will be something. Uh, there, we could also get it into an equilibrium point. Well. <clears throat> That one is not as trivial to um, solve. We, we could probably work it, we could work it out here. Um, you could imagine, if I called SimPy solve these set of equations for Q1, Q2, and Q3, we have three equations and three unknowns, it should be able to tell me what every value of Q1 and Q2, every combination of Q1, Q2, and Q3 that are valid equilibrium points. Turns out that this one is a nasty enough trig, trig, trig function that SimPy solve doesn't solve it. You can, you can solve it if you like do a lot of manual manipulation, um, but I'm not going to do that because it, it, took, it took a long time, and, um, and I still wasn't sure I quite got it right. Uh, but often these are easier to solve numerically. So if I use a root finding um, method, like a newton rapson or something, um, with th these expressions, I could find all the roots, giving di given different guesses numerically. And that's typically what you're probably going to end up doing for complex finding all the um, equilibrium points. It's not, the key thing is it's not trivial to solve the equilibrium point analytically all the time. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But we do know that we, we believe these two, and, and that's fine, because we can move through it with showing how the linearization works. So now, I set up this V, and I'm just claiming this is our equilibrium point for our system. Configuration zero, no motion. So if we follow, if we follow out what I had, um, let's call, let's make a V subs equals dick zip um, V and V naught. And that, that just keeps, gives us our dictionary that lets us uh, substitute in all the zeros for everything. Okay. So now we can write um, the linear version of those equations is going to be F evaluated at V subs, right? We plug in the equilibrium point, plus F dot Jacobian with respect to V times um, V minus V naught. And let's do a 
I think this will simplify in a reasonable amount of time so that we can have a look at that. So that, that was the equation I gave you before, right? Very nice, simple translation to the SymPy code. I take um, fr plus fr star, substitute in the equilibrium point, calculate its Jacobi, and that gets all the partial derivatives, multiply it by v minus v naught. And whether my trig sim is going to work or not, there we go. So these are the three linear equations in all of our variables. So if I um, look around and, did I screw up? Why are there signs in here? What do we do wrong? Oh, and what do I do wrong here? I wonder why, it's not supposed to be that long. Do something incorrect. Oh, anybody see what I forgot to do? I did the differentiate. That's the Jacobian. I got to evaluate it. <laughs> we left all these things in, right? So if I do, I got to add a subs, um, v subs here. All right, so you, you evaluate at the equilibrium point. You evaluate the Jacobian at the equilibrium point, then you multiply, and then we'll get then we'll get what we want. All right, much better, much quicker. So now we can look at these equations and notice that any of our um, configuration speeds or accelerations are have just linear coefficients, right? Linear coefficient, linear coefficient, linear coefficient linear coefficient, it's all there. So we have, an we have these three equations are now linear in every variable that I listed here. Okay, so that's like a systematic way of doing that linearization. And then um, you can put, so if we have f of, uh, and this is this lin linear version, and it's also um, of q, u, and u dot. You can write, um, since this is now linear, you can write it in this form. And uh, that. Who, who's seen this form before? Nobody? So this is, this is often called the canonical form for a linear equations, linear second order differential equations. Mass matrix, damping matrix, stiffness matrix. I know you've seen the scalar version of this, right, when there's only a single value. But here, since we had three equations, ours is going to be, this is going to be a 3 by 3, a 3 by 3, 3 by 3, and each of these are 3 by 1. And then this is all the remaining terms that aren't functions of our coordinates, speeds, or accelerations that are the... Uh, often called the forcing. So stiffness matrix, damping matrix, mass matrix, right? And then this forcing. Forcing, it, it's just a vector, three by one. So how, with SymPy, how could we get a hold of these matrices from our expression there? Our vector expression. Any guess on that? Do 
chat with your neighbor. How, how could we extract M, C, and K, and F from, from this, knowing that it, it is linear? I'll give you a clue. We've already used the function today that would help you. I got an idea. How would you how would you do it on paper? Combine like terms. What what are like terms? So anything with a U dot in front of it, put into one matrix, put anything with a U in front of it, except maybe with Q in another matrix. Yeah. So if we maybe start with Qs, this equation has a Q one no other Q's in it. So if we look for the stiffness matrix, we'll have one entry of negative K in that top row first column of, of that stiffness matrix K. Here, if we look for U1's, Q1's, there's no Q1's. So then we have zero there. Uh, are there any Q2s? There's a Q2 and a Q3. So we'll see in column two um, of, the second of the second row, we'll see that. And in column three, we'll see that. So I could extract the coefficients, place them into the things. Uh, there is a coefficients. Um, if you do something like F len. I think you often have to expand first, so it sort of multiplies everything out. And then I got, if I want the coefficients of all the U2 dots, right, I can, I'll, I can grab those. So I think, I think you can do this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe matrix doesn't have that. Um, I guess just to show the, just to show that exists, if I grab the first row, first column, so I just get a single expression, and then I do that. It's one of these. There we go. So if I went, if I got equation, if I took a single expression, SymPy does have a coefficient thing, and it'll give me, for u1 dot, um, right, got that. <clears throat> if you have a linear equation, though, um, there's an operation we just did that would also very nicely return coefficients. If I take the derivative of the first expression with respect to u1 dot, what do I get?
right? If I have a linear, linear equation is linear in u1 dot, and I take the derivative of it, I'm always going to get this constant coefficient. Bam. So now, how do I do this in one command to get mc m? Jacobian. F lin dot Jacobian u diff, right? Where u is a column matrix. That is m. All right, C. Go ahead and compute C and K for me then. Now you know that. So you should get this. Um, we only had one damping, one damper in the whole thing, a linear damper. So that showed up there, and we didn't have any kind of velocity terms that would cross couple, couple in the velocity in this particular model. Um, and then we get the stiffness matrix. This is notice the mass matrix. It's a it's a symmetric matrix, right? It has diagonals, and then the cro the um, uh, top. Uh, upper triangle half is, is the same as the lower triangle half. So that's a symmetric matrix. You're going to get a symmetric matrix for the mass matrix um, in, in general always for dynamic systems. Okay, And it's going to have inertia and mass terms in it. Um, and that's what we see. And then here you're going to see things. This could have explicit damping and dissipation, or it can also have terms that are associated with um, Coriolis, and um, and gyroscopic effects. Okay, so those are terms that are tied to velocities, and then terms that are tied to the cues. They're going to be stiffnesses of springs and gravity-related terms that associate with coordinates. So here we have uh, linear equations, and then f. How do we get f? If I subtract away all those things we just computed, F are these terms that aren't associated with the coordinates, right? The, for, the, the forcing terms. So here I've put this in the canonical linear form. Um, let's take a five minute break. Come back at uh, uh, eleven fifteen, okay, and then you can think about that. But this is uh, a very useful form if you want to study um, the linear dynamics. You can find the eigenvalues of that and um, learn the entire system dynamics, which you may have done in other classes. Okay, but five minute break here. How many people have heard of state space form? Everybody seen that yet? Uh, you'll typically see it in your control class. This is the canonical linear second order form. There's also a uh, if I introduce x in our case and make it q over u, then I can write x dot equals some matrix A times x plus B U. <clears throat> and that also introducing U 
in our case, F and T are the only two um, inputs there. This is called state space form. And same equations written in a different form. In our case, this is going to be a 6 by 6, 6 by 1, 6 by 1, um, 2 by 1, 6 by 2. Right? This form is the uh, general form. This is equivalent, this is the first order explicit form of the linear equations of motion. Right? And it combines the dynamic equations that we have here and the kinematic differential equations into one. So we, we've already put our nonlinear equations into explicit first order form. Well, if you happen to have linear equations, you can write them as such. And then, A, let me, let me uh, write up on the board too. We had this, and then we also have our um, relationship Q dots equal the equal some function, uh, linear function. Let's introduce, uh, let me put another matrix in here. Um, let's use, uh, do, do we use Y for the kin kinematic differential equations? Maybe Y of uh, the U's, or linear in the U's, plus uh, Z. Right? Dynamic equations and the kinematical difference equations. And here, this would be 3 by 1, 3 by 1, 3 by 3, 3 by, by 1. We can put these in this form um, if A equals um, and then uh, Q dots are going to equal, um, they're not going to have any uh, Qs, but they'll have a Y term there. Okay? And you'll, there's a linear form of that and a nonlinear form. You don't want any cosines of Qs in there, but you could, you could get a hold of these for whatever you have. For the, for the simple case where the Us equal the Q dots, this is just the identity matrix. Okay? This is 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 3 by 3. And then B is going to be negative M inverse on the bottom for a let me let me include zero here I don't have to screw up so negative in M inverse will be that bottom portion three by three and then uh, there will be a zero matrix here and um, getting beyond what I wrote out, but simple case is that relationship, right? The Q dots equal the U's. Let's just write that case here. So that, that'll be I, a 3 by 3, because I don't want to, I'd have to add an extra term to deal with the Z. Let's just leave it, leave it like this, okay? In, in, in our case, that's what we had. We had the Q dots equal the U's in this particular example. So I can form A and B. This combines the kinematic differential equations and the dynamic differential equations to get the f explicit first order linear form. So we could do this by A equals um, SM dot zeros 
let's just do sm dot zeros <coughs> three by three dot uh, I think it's let's see if this works row join sm dot i three okay that's the top two rows and then column join I think we would do um, negative m we could do uh, negative m dot lu solve okay and dot row join negative m dot lu solve c It gets pretty nasty. Let's see if it's <clears throat> won't take too long. Maybe maybe this one will simplify. So there, I just took our MCK matrices and constructed this matrix by joining. Um, so sub matrices together that three by three zeros three by three i and then yeah that's not bad and then our m inverse k so here i get a is now a six by six okay and that is our state matrix and if you're if you've Taking controls and things, right? I can take the eigenvalues of this and I can tell you all everything you want to know about the dynamics of that linear system from those eigenvalues. We're not going to get into that. You can take the controls class to think about that more. And then B, we could um, form in the same way. Get you what you need to move forward in um, solving that, uh, or whatever else you want to do with that. Okay, so this is I gave the canonical uh, form of the equations of motion here, and this um, state space form in first order, and that's and that's how we get that. I think it's supposed to be column join. I always get confused. Questions on that part? Okay, one one last bit here. Remember, we had a we have a cane object here. If I look, it has a linearized method on it. Linearize the equations of motion about a symbolic operating point. Okay. And it's going to return the mass matrix times QU equals this. This is a little bit different form than what we have. Um, M inverse times A would give us the A that we have here. Uh, but what it does is it, um, it gives you that form, but you can also uh, set A and B to true, and it'll give you the A that we just got, okay? And the way that works is if we do um, A and B equals true, and there's a, I think it's op point, here and if I give it um, if I give it uh, q1 0 q2 0 q3 0 u1 0 u2 0 u3 0 
I don't have to give it the accelerations. I think it'll automatically do do that. Let's say a equals b, and I think it also returns. It returns what u is here. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to use. Yeah, I shouldn't have. I should have used r here because we've already got a u. So let's use r. If I do that. And then let's simplify. Should be the same thing we just got. Hopefully. <laughs> and uh, this linearized method on Kane, it properly deals with if you do have any dependent configura these configuration constraints that I mentioned earlier. Um, it will deal with those properly and, and make sure all the derivatives are done. Okay, so I said there was this, the way I just showed you, there's this little detail when you have these configuration constraints. But I think that's, we got the same thing. So Kane dot linearize, give it the operating point, bam. And you, go ahead. Yeah, it, it implements something similar to what we just did. Um, it has a few details to catch uh, other corner cases. The other, the other thing that you can do is um, you don't even have to put values here. You could also put symbols as the, um, as the uh, if I could say Q1 equals Q1 naught as a symbol, a symbolic operating point, arbitrary operating point, and it will calculate this. This will be a big messier set of equations with that in there, but you can do that too. Um, and then uh, what's nice about that is you can numerically f um, figure out all the equilibrium points of any kind of complex system and sort of move forward numerically after this. But uh, there's your linearization. Questions on all that? That's, that's basically what I wanted to show you, that you can convert any of these equations of motion that you all discover into a linear form that represents the small motions about an operating point. Make sense? Cool? I saw like one head nod. <laughs> the controls part, I'm struggling to remember. Um, Once you have your state space, how do you build a control? Yeah, so the basic control thing is that if you have linear equations, you have this huge set of tools to make controllers. If you want to control a nonlinear system, which is what we have in general, uh, the tools are much more limited and difficult to um, implement. But you put these things, it turns out that you can linearize models, build a controller for it, and they often are robust. Uh, uh, and then you can do other fun little things, and you can make them robust, and they work even with nonlinear systems, right? You put on a real robot that's not the linear thing. So, it, so it's it's a very viable, you know, you can you can do a, an insane amount with a linear form, and you get to have analytical understanding of a lot of aspects of that uh, system. But the key thing, eigenvalues of the A matrix and the eigenvectors of the A matrix describe in a very succinct way all you want can possibly know about the dynamics of that system of that linear system. So just like we used it to uh, work with um, principal moments and pr principal components, um, eigenvalues play a role there too, to understand. Turn, with a linear system, the eigenvalues tell you how it moves. That's the answer to that. But that's all like, you're going to get out of this class, out of the linear stuff, unfortunately. Maybe I uh, can have more. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you just take a controls class and you'll get a good shot of that. Yeah. Okay. So we got 20 minutes left. Let me show you just uh, a few minutes of the attitude stuff. I apologize, not not quite getting to all of that. Um, and I think instead of me writing things on the board, 
I'm going to open a new notebook and just show a few details here. Okay, let's introduce Q1, Q2, Q3. And let's do some simple rotations. Start off with the first reference frame in, and then I'm going to rotate A with respect to N. about an axis through angle Q1 and it's going to be the N X axis. Then I'm going to do B with respect to A about the A Y and then C with respect to B about Q3 with respect to the BX. Thank you. Okay, so what does this do? <clears throat> this rotates A on the NX, okay? And NX equals AX, okay? So we rotate about also AX. Here, we rotate about AYBY. Here, we rotate about BY, BXCX. Okay, so we rotate, in this case, it's called the body fixed rotations. Okay, so each time I, um, if this is my um, uh, X, Y, and Z, right, I first rotate about it, X, the body fixed. And then I pick Y of the of, that's attached to that body. And then I go back to X of the body and rotate. All right. So I'm always picking axes that are at each of those intermediate rotations the body fixed rotation. Okay. So this is called body body fixed rotation. X Y Z. Sorry. X Y X through Q1 Q2 Q3. Then if I do C dot DCM in, that's the direction cosine matrix that relates these two through those three rotations. All right. So we manually did that. You can also do body through three angles and tell it what axes x y x same rotation matrix those three angles there can orient a, the reference frame to any arbitrary or a reference frame C 
to any arbitrary orientation relative to n. Okay? So if I had a vector in the C-frame, I can make that vector point in any direction I want with, at minimum, these three angles. Okay? The order matters, too. If I did x, 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 do you, could I rotate it in any arbitrary way? Always rotating about the x? You can't. Okay? So it's important that what order you do, and you can't necessarily repeat certain ones. There are 12 different combinations here on this body fixed. There's like z, y, z, um, y, z, z. Those are ones. Anytime where you have repeated values here, those are Euler angles, which you may have heard of. So Euler angles um, are a set of six rotations that are the combinations such that of x, y, and z such that you have either y, y, z, z, or x, x with, with uh, x, y, or z in the middle. Those are Euler angles. There's another set of six body fixed rotations called Tate, Bryan, or, or um, angles. And I was going to write all this for you, but I could just, you can look, um, no, that's not it. If you look at like Euler, Wikipedia page, for example, you can get a more thorough explanation there. But up there at the top, right, Euler angles, ZXZ, XYX, da 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 da, Tate Bryan, da da da. Twelve different combinations of three angles that you can rotate in those orders of body fixed axes, and you can orient one reference frame to another in any arbitrary orientation that you want. Okay, so Euler angles and Tate Bryan angles um, are typically used. That first Tate Bryan angle, X, Y, Z, for vehicles is roll, pitch, yaw. So if you think about a vehicle, the typical coordinate system is X is like the forward motion of the vehicle, Z is down, and um, uh, X into Y is the side. So I can put any vehicle I want here, maybe an airplane. And I have a body fixed set of coordinates here. X is roll, Z is yaw, and Y is pitch. I could put a car there too. Okay? And these. Um, so the Tate Bryan angles XYZ correspond to the standard definition that's typically used for vehicles. And you can use any of them. Now, why would I use different ones? <clears throat> There's a thing called gimbal lock. Okay? So these coordinates If I calculate the angular velocity in N, we get this. I'll show you one more quick thing. Sorry we didn't get to get to go into this much. Um, if I say that U1 equals Omega C, if I define my generalized speeds like so, Get to use and then sm dot solve u1, u2, and u3 for the q dots q1 diff, q2 diff, q3 diff.
Why did that not work? Not supposed to give me zero. What am I doing wrong? Oh, <clears throat> I shouldn't have named these. Uh, I, I need a new I need a new variable variable here. Uh, I don't. I don't think I don't think I'm going to go beyond that. Um, so I want to make sure we do these evals. Bottom line is, if I did this correctly, you're going to see cosines and sines on the denominator of these expressions. There's certain angles that will make that denominator zero, and that denominator being zero gives you gimbal lock. You can't compute the angular velocity at certain angles. So it turns out that uh, for this set, um, <clears throat> you can get you can get gimbal lock if you flip the plane over, right? If I do a, a loop de loop with the plane, I would get gimbal lock. The last key thing is there is that most of the, a lot of many cases you don't need it. You can pick the right combinations of Euler's Euler or Tate Bryan angles for all kinds of systems that work just fine. But if you have to do a loop de loop in your airplane then you want to reach out for other things, in particular things like quaternions or um, Rodriguez parameters or Euler parameters. And those are three ways to set up your con direction cosine matrices and the angular velocity such that it's impossible to have gimbal lock. That's, that's all on that. Sorry we didn't get to get further there. Okay, so the last thing, what I want you all to do is, um, I think if you go to eval that, ucdavis.edu, and um, you can log in and you can fill out your eval. So eval.ucdavis.edu. Um, but I, wanna, I wanted to say a couple of things, um, especially since you're grad students. Um, I'm a, uh, on my way to getting tenure as a professor, and they grade me on my teaching, and I'm a teaching professor. So these um, evaluations uh, matter. And in particular, you might be surprised, um, the, almost the only thing that my peers look at when they say if I'm a good teacher or not is a single value, and that is the average number for the one question on the e evaluations that, that says, is this instructor overall an effective instructor? Okay? Now, um, as a quick little demo, um, it turns out that that question can be extremely uh, biased. And uh, I just want to show you a demo. You may have seen this, if I can find it. These are results from classes from ratemyprofessor.com. Okay? And all these subjects, right? Each um, name of the professor, you can pretty well guess if it's a male or a female. Now, <clears throat> Um, if you look at the words that, um, let me refresh this, if you look at the words associated, if I look at the word funny in all of Rate My Professor, how often does it show up in male or female things? Well, we see that male professors are much funnier than female professors from Rate My Professor. Now, <clears throat> You know, I know good female comedians and good male comedians, but uh, this, this is a nice, you can put in any word you want and see if there is gender bias associated with ratings of teachers. Turns out that for many things, um, there is. Sometimes it's biased to male, sometimes it's biased to female, often it's biased to um, male more than female, for sure, like this one, right? Female teachers are not funny, apparently males are. So, 
Um, think carefully when you fill out these evaluations. I would like you, if you can, uh, that effective question. Think about the learning objectives on, our web on my website. And if you think you learned them, then you know, maybe I'm an effective teacher. And, and, and try to state that. You, know, you may not like me. You may find my jokes bad. You may hate me. You may not like my homeworks, whatever. Uh, you can tell me that. The other thing is that nobody really reads any of the other except me. So if you, I want to improve my class, and I want to improve my teaching. So please um, give me feedback. And it's good, just like I've asked you before in these, the feedback that I tried to do in the middle of the class, um, a positive and a negative. Right? I can do something with that. Right? If you tell me, well, what's good that I'm doing, I can keep doing it. If you tell me what's bad that didn't help you learn, then I can adjust that. So I promise you that I will read what you say, think carefully about it. Uh, but I also want you to think, too, um, about the questions and answer them um, you know, to, what, to more what they're asking instead of, uh, am I effective because I'm funny or not? Right? So that's all. Take, take a few minutes, fill out that. I appreciate um, you all have had a fun time in the class. I really like the subject, and I uh, hope that you have gained some appreciation. And um, we'll, I'll see you in office hours and things, I'll, and I'll post another one. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you all do in your projects next week. Okay, And I'll say, say, say a final bye then. But uh, thank you very much.